being an entertainer, you can often become the entertainment to the point where the focus is on you at the wedding. And I never wanted it to be that way. I always wanted to facilitate the party to keep the focus on the guests or guests of honor. Good morning, good day, and good evening to all of my wonderful listeners. Uh, today's episode is amazing. It's actually with someone I hold really near and dear to my heart. It's one of the first companies I worked with as a young teenager. And um, this gentleman, Mike Spinato, is the one who actually really showed me the ropes, of what it's like to work in a small business and how to structure it. And I worked with him, I think, when I was 17 to about 30 years of age, so well over a decade. Um I learned how to lead a team, how to be a novice, how to grow in the ranks. I mean, really, this was the foundation of my knowledge skill set, was watching him how he led his team and taking that knowledge and kind of encapsulating that for many of the different career paths and businesses that I've chosen. Um, we get into it where, where how to grow company culture, how to have your employees really care about your business, how to, to the point really where they're working as though they own the company. And that's really what we kind of get after right now. Um, and how Mike Spinato really fostered this growth intentionally within Eclipse events. Um, we also get into a little bit of the operational side of the business, um, how to organize and structure these events all the way through the sales conception and deliverables, how to deliver outstanding customer service to your clients as well. So this is an episode you really don't want to miss. Um, really stay until the end because Mike really gives some really insightful life advice um, near, I, I want to say the 45 minute mark where he discusses like the three key elements to not only having a thriving business, but to make sure you also have a great personal success story. So stay tuned and, uh, let's get into it. All right. What's going on you classy listeners. I am here with my all time favorite person. Um, <laughs> someone who's like been like a father figure to me. I personally worked for him for since I was 18. So almost 15 years, if you can believe it, I've known this man. Um, he's a successful business owner. He's a wonderful father, a husband, um, and just an all around genuine, amazing human being to be around. And it's my privilege and honor to introduce you to Michael Spinata. Well, thank you, Steve. That introduction <laughs> is pretty amazing. I appreciate that. And yes, Stephen worked for me for a very long time. And, uh, I'm proud to say that he's come a long way and he's doing really well for himself as well. But thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm really excited to be here. This is a this is a full circle moment for us. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> funny, man. I because I started out as just an 18 year old here, and this is the really my first real job, so to speak, working for uh, a DJ company. And I was a real fresh novice, and I remember just it being an incredible opportunity to watch you run the business and learn from you as a young man. That kind of seeded the idea of entrepreneurship in my own brain as time kind of went on. So it's been one hell of a Well, I even remember how we met. Um, I had another business and I would had some trucks that I would keep parked on a property and the property was owned by his dad. And uh, his dad actually said to me, hey, you want to give my kid a job? <laughs> and I said- Sounds about right, yeah. That, that's totally what yeah. he said. And um, I said, well, what's he like? And he said, he's a really good kid. He's just working at Staples and he's looking for an opportunity. And, uh, I think you were 16. It was young man. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know what, let me meet him and see if there's an opportunity there. And, uh, you came to work for me and you were with me for many, many years. And it was great having you work, uh, for as long as you worked. So thank you. Yeah. I think I appreciate it, man. So, so I, I kind of want to bring it back to the early days, even before I, I knew you, to the your uh, old DJ Mikey Spins days. Okay. So what what sparked your interest in getting into the DJ business? And uh, at what age did you really start kind of dabbling into the DJ world? I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn. And um, in Brooklyn, you know, there were a lot of DJs. And there was a lot of athletes. And there was a lot of burnouts. And... <laughs> The burnouts would sit in the parks and they would, you know, smoke pot and hang out and really do nothing with their lives. And that definitely wasn't who I was. Um, I was never really the greatest athlete. 
Um, I did play some hockey in high in junior high and high school, but that was more recreational. I just never really was into the organized sports. And I always loved music. And um, there were a couple of DJs that lived on my block. There was another DJ who lived a block away from me. Uh, and I would hang out with them. They were a little bit older than me and they would show me how to mix the music and work the turntables. And it just was fascinating to me. And I said, I really want to do this. And this is back in the late seventies, early eighties. So before- uh, this is 82, 83. Yeah, so no computers, no like looking up songs online. Nothing. No computers, no looking up songs online, no Napster, no yep. Spotify, nothing. It was all records um, with a microphone and a mixer and a set of headphones and a set of speakers. And you were changing song by song by song physically yep. record for, for on the record on the turntable. Um, so I, uh, I just said to my dad, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And he, uh, he said, well, if this is an interest that you have, we'll get you uh, a beginner set of equipment and see where it goes. And it was instant. I just fell in love with it. I would work on it for hours and hours and hours a day or night in my basement after school uh, until we booked my first party, um, which was a block party uh, for a cousin. Of course, nobody's going to hire me Sure, for not knowing who I was. And then um, from there, watching the effect that I had on people where I could play certain songs and it would get a reaction and it would bring people to the dance floor, um, it just, it was like a drug. It really was. Um, and I just kept going. I kept going from there and I worked for another DJ company for a while to gain some experience. And I utilized that to start booking more jobs and then that lasted about two years. And uh, then when I was about 16 or so, uh, I was off and running on my own. You know, everybody just knew me as uh, DJ Mike. The name of my company at the time was the best sound around. And there's always a, there's a slogan that I had at the time, which was um, people still make fun of me to this day about it. Always. Do you remember <laughs> what that was? Come dance to the music you like with DJ Mike. Dance to the music you like with DJ Mike. <laughs> um, it's true. Uh, and I it, love the '80s, man. It just it just went from there. Um, so yeah, so that was how I got my start. Uh, never really did the club circuit. I did mostly mobile, all mobile entertainment, weddings, sweet sixteens, uh, communions, block parties, uh, anniversary parties, you know, stuff like that. Well, I know you were also, uh, I believe you went to Hofstra. You were also a full-time college student. Were you doing this as like a hobby side hustle while also maintaining a full you know, student life and then eventually a corporate nine to five? Did you think of this as a business early on or is this more of like, hey, this is a great end to the meet for now? Um, well, I always worked. I, I mean, I started working, um, sweeping floors in a, in a, a, a shop that made women's clothing I worked for an auto mechanic, sweeping floors, changing oil. Um, I then worked in men's formal wear uh, at a tuxedo store. Um, I always had a job and I would always moonlight on the weekends as a DJ. For me, at first, it was more about the fun. Sure. It was more about the social interaction that I had with people. Um, but then I realized, you know, hey, I could make some money at this. I could do a party and make in one night, you know, what some guys my age at that time were making in a week. So it was like, I knew that this could be something that I would want to do as a side hustle. Uh, always sort of thinking in my mind that I wanted a, a stable day job with paid benefits and paid vacations. Um, you know, I, the whole thing. Yeah. 401k plan. And I did that. I went into, after college, I went into, um, I went into corporate IT and I, I worked for some big name companies. Uh, I was a network admin for Tiffany and company for a long time. I was a director of IT for a women's clothing designer. Um, you know, and then one day it all came to a halt. There was, um, a, a company I was working for and I didn't really get along with my immediate vice president and, um, things didn't work out and I was laid off. 
Uh, and I went home that day and I said to my wife that I wasn't going back to a day job and I was going to push my entertainment business uh, to a point where we can survive. It was a point in time where I had some money in the bank from my day job. So I was able to uh, sort of work odd jobs at the time. I, um, I painted houses. I delivered groceries. I delivered pizza. I drove a limo. I fixed computers. I did anything and everything I had to do while I built the DJ business to a point where I would be self-sustained. Um, you were driven to say the least to, to make this work. I really wanted to make this work. It's a complete passion of mine and I needed to know that I could do this. I needed to know that there was so many people out there that just did it as a hobby. And I knew at the time that it was on the, the precipice of becoming something that could be a full-time career, uh, and a real company, you know, and to, prove people wrong to say that being a wedding DJ is not just um, a side gig. Sure. And at the time too, I think children of the eighties and even nineties, the bands were like the wedding thing. Like you hired a band for the most part and DJs weren't really quite as popular at the time. It's very true. Uh, even all my siblings, they had um, live bands as their wedding for their wedding entertainment. Uh, for me, I felt that we could give a better value because A, you're giving all the original artists. B, I had a huge personality and we're giving uh, the personality of a DJ to amp people up and get involved with everybody and get involved on the dance floor. Uh, and then C, you're giving a much lower price. You only have to pay one or two people versus a nine piece band. Sure. So it was a fraction of the cost. And I, I will happily say that I was definitely part of that movement in the in the area that I grew up in. So, and how were you initially getting these early clients back in the day? Where is it a lot of word of mouth? So there really was no advertising back then. It was people seeing you at a party. Uh, it was um, just your network of friends. And then once you started doing those parties, it just organically grew. Uh, you know, this is before cell phones. This is before Google. This is way before Instagram and and. TikTok and everything else that's out now, it was it was really even before email was a major thing. Right. Um, you know, I don't think I played on a laptop until I was in my 30s. You know, <laughs> at first it was all records and then it moved to CDs. Um, I mean, I even edited on reel-to-reels, sure. you know, back in the day to create custom edits of songs. Um so yeah, it was it was a, a long time coming, but everything was organic. It really was, and and I was maxing out at the time. Uh, when I when I was when I decided that I didn't need another source of income, I was probably doing about a hundred events a year by myself, primarily weekends. So primarily really, that, weekend that gets really delineated very quickly to only fifty two weeks a year. Correct. I was working every Friday, Saturday, or every Saturday, Sunday. I was working. Every weekend. Um, and then I realized that I was hitting a ceiling where I couldn't really earn much more, but I knew that the business had so much more potential. So I really stepped up and I decided to bring in my first employee, um, somebody that I could train to run the business with me, do the sales, um, do some marketing going around like guerrilla marketing or mm -hmm. stomping the, your feet on the ground, you know, um, just to get into venues and talk to people. Um, and I didn't, I hired a gentleman by the name of Anthony Batista, who still with me today. I mean, he officiated my wedding. Great guy. <laughs> he officiated Steve's wedding. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and we really, we really grew the business together and scaled it together, uh, from a hundred jobs a year just by myself to, you know, we're doing somewhere around 400 events a year now. Which is amazing. Thank you. Um, now, what, what? let's rewind it a little bit back about the relationship side. And I think this is something that you have almost like a, a built-in nature about being of this warm, lovable personality, right? Anyone who's around you, make them feel very comfortable. Thank you. Very trusting. Um, the relationship side of it is, to your point, very, very key. How did you build up these relationships with some of these venues that you're working in? Because obviously when you first got there, there's, you know, they didn't really know you. So 
talk to me a little bit about how you grew that. So I think that I think that back in the day, the way it worked was um, people would hear about you. You would make a contact. You would go to the venue. You would introduce yourself formally. Uh, and then I would always really just say to them, give me a shot. You know, if you give me a shot, I'll do it. I'll do a wedding or something at a very deep discounted price. And you'll see the work that we do because back then, again, there was no social media. So they needed to be able to see how you worked in person. They needed to understand that you were going to take care of their clients. It wasn't necessarily about kickbacks or commissions. Sure. It was more about providing service, being a man of your word yeah. and providing a good solid service and showing people a good time. And then once that, once you had your foot in the door and you became that um, source for stability and and credibility and confidence you know people would would call you back over and over and over again at the venues they would say this is the guy you should be using he does a really great job um he'll do the right thing by you as far as making sure you feel well taken care of making sure that you all your guests will have a really good time uh, the big thing at the time i never forget was always um a lot of djs didn't understand the art of playing what the crowd wanted to hear. They always went in with this thought of, I'm gonna play what I wanna hear and what I think works, but it wasn't really taking into consideration the people who are in attendance. And I always really focused on that because I felt like this is, I'm not DJing for me. If I wanted to DJ for myself, I could do that in my basement. Right, or in a nightclub set. Or in a nightclub. Right. If I wanted to DJ for, for myself, I would not be doing weddings. I have to realize that those clients are priority number one. And I had to definitely learn how to read the crowd and play to the crowd. I also never went in with a predetermined set list. Um, I always had ideas from the client as to what they thought they would like, what their family would like, what their families got up and danced to in the past. And then I would take those guidelines and I would sort of expand upon them. So a lot of stuff was sort of expected but still yet there was an element of surprise because i grew out onto the same genres and the same styles um but just expanded it out so that when they're on the dance floor they understand that we're playing a disco set or a motown set that they wanted some of those songs but now they're hearing additional songs in those genres that they're like oh my god i love this too this is great i didn't think of this song we're not hitting them with stuff that's completely random. It's all somewhat in the same realm of- Right, you're not gonna go from Motown to Biggie Smalls necessarily in the same set. Right. Just wouldn't flow. No, absolutely. It, putting the client first, I think. And it seems so simple now in hindsight, but it's amazing that people didn't really have that expectation back then. And I think to really have a successful business, that's something key that you have to really consider is like, what can I do to make this event as spectacular as possible. Not what I, to your point, not what I want to hear, but what they want to hear. And how can I offer my experience to even polish that up into an, even a better bundle? Where having the reps in of a hundred weddings, a thousand weddings that can kind of better that product. Well, I think, I think the main thing is, is that, you know, being an entertainer, you can often become the entertainment. Um, to the point where the focus is on you at the wedding. And I never wanted it to be that way. I always wanted to facilitate the party to keep the focus on the guests or guests of honor. Um, I wanted to be that, um, that person that made sure that everybody left that party knowing that it was their wedding, not just another DJ Mike show. Right. Exactly. Essentially. And so, that kind of catapulted you to really start gaining some momentum now in the business. And at the time, it was just really yourself and Anthony. When did it start to really snowball where it went from just making, you know, let's say under $100,000 a year to like really capitulating into a thriving business where it's not just you running the company, it's you have a brand now, like Eclipse Events is an actual company. So the answer to that is um, we decided as a group, as a team, Anthony and I, that we would start offering additional services. So it started out with lighting. Um, lighting was the first thing that we really went into 
that really made people see that there was more to a DJ company than just being a DJ. We could now change the vibe and change the mood in the room just by, but just by adding in some lighting. Uh, from lighting, it went into TV screens. So using the TV screens was a way for us to personalize the event. We were taking pictures of people at the party, putting them up on the screens. We were putting up the logo of the bride and groom. We would be able to put together a photo montage and show it on the, on the TVs at night with music. So we've just now encapsulated the, the guests that much more into our um, world of what we're trying to put out there. Um, it then went into photo booths. Sure. Uh, photo booths was a huge thing for years. It still is tremendous. We own six photo booths now. Um, and it was just adding more value-added services to the event to work with one vendor, which is a huge value-added service because if you were to hire a DJ and a lighting company and a photo booth company, you're now hiring three different companies and you have to manage that process. Right. Three different points of contact. With one, one person. Um, adding to that, we also eventually dove into photography and cinematography, which was a tremendous boost to our bottom line. You know, and we, and we do it all in-house. We do all the shooting, we do all the editing, we do all the preparations, the post-production, we do all of the album creation. Um, it, it, it has become a full service event production company for weddings. But to even add to your, your question even more, we also branched out into more different, uh, more, more types of events. So we're not just doing a wedding or a Sweet 16 anymore. We're now doing corporate events. We're doing product launches. We're doing uh, annual meetings. We're doing um, grand openings. Uh, we're doing so many different events, fundraisers, that we've just changed our business model from a two to three day a week business to a seven day a week business because these corporate events are happening during the week. Right, consistent revenue uh, now. Consistent revenue all week long. And I say this with a lot of service business owners, someone who is in like even photography business or I'm in a real estate business, to look what's involved and in what you're producing. Like for me, I have the property management real estate company and I saw opportunities for the construction side of it as part of just a natural synergy of having one point of contact to solve your problems. So it seems to be the same same solution, the same thing. It really is the same thing to give more options for the for people to choose in one shot. So even on the corporate end, we're not only doing the audio visual, but we also provide staging. We provide the lighting. We provide um, drapery. We provide furniture. Um, so there, so a company can come to us and say, "Hey, we're holding a fundraiser, and I could provide everything that they need on the day of." Uh, with one contract, one point of contact. Um, you know, we also provide the tech staff to operate everything on the day of. You've been to plenty of those. Sure, events. that's what I was doing. <laughs> uh, it absolutely was. So I think that it's really important to know that, you know, not only do you want to grow vertically, but you want to grow horizontally as well. And then all of those other channels that you're, you're building are all going to grow simultaneously across the board. And then you have analytics and you could find out what's what's exceeding, what's excelling, what's not, what services should you not offer anymore? What other services should you begin to offer? Um, so yeah, so there's there's a there was a time where to your point before is, you know, when did this happen where you went from a DJ to a full service company? There's a time where you realize that you know, I now am married. I now own a home. I now have responsibility. I have right. two children. We have a few cars in the family. Um, you know, we need to plan for retirement. So how do you do that is you just figure out how to expand and grow your existing business. So let's take a peek behind the curtain now to getting back into expansion. So obviously now you're not a two person operation. Um, what is the operation like? And this is something I think that I know personally from working in companies that you excel at building company culture. And you might think of like a DJ company of like, oh, it's just a bunch of guys that show up and they play music and they kind of go home and that's the end of it. But you fostered really long lasting relationships internally where your employees 
really cared about the business. So, so I could totally speak to that. So I looked at how other DJ companies operated and I felt like they weren't just doing it the way that I was comfortable with. And for example, a lot of other DJ companies will hire DJs who have their own vehicle, have their own equipment, um, and they'll just subcontract them to do parties. Um, I've seen other DJ companies that own their own equipment and own their own vehicles and have their own warehouse, um, but the DJ and the MC just shows up to the job, whereas there's a setup crew that goes out and sets the job up and and the roadies, so it's the roadies, the stagehands. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of like look at both of those models and create my own model. And my own model was that I still wanted to own all my own equipment. I wanted to own the vehicles. I wanted to be responsible for all the maintenance of the equipment, um, where the warehousing was. And the reason why I wanted that part is so that I could have consistency in the product that I'm putting out. When you hire a DJ that owns his own equipment, there's no way for you to, to, um, keep that um, similar across the board and keep the consistency in the look across the board. One guy may use a JBL set of speakers. Another guy may use another set of speakers. And at the end of the day, the sound is completely different from both of them. Um, you wanted almost to McDonaldize it, but not in a, the delineated kind of like McDonald franchise. You wanted to have- Sort of like a franchise model. You're getting, you, you know what you're getting with the product. So it's consistent. Yeah, it's consistent across the board. The second thing that I wanted to create was I wanted everybody to always meet at the warehouse. Um, from the DJ to the MC, to the support staff, to everybody. They meet at the warehouse, they load the vehicle together, they travel to the jobs together, they set up the job together, they do the job together, they break it down and they go back to the warehouse and then they part ways at the end of the night. You know, that puts more hours onto their day, of course, However, what that does is it, I, I call it, it takes away the prima donna syndrome. And the prima donna syndrome is, is when you have guys setting up a job, working a job and sweating all day long and putting in the sweat equity. And then all of a sudden the prima donna MC and DJ show up and they do their job and they're the highest paid ones on the job. And then at the end of the party, they just leave. That creates animosity could create definitely create resentment for sure and resentment between the team members because they're not all in it together and so having it the way that i developed it 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 puts people on the same level playing field yes the dj and the mc are still the two leaders of the job and they still do make the most on the job but they also harbor the most amount of talent um they have this they have the, the appropriate skill level to match what their salary is absolutely and at the end of the day if there is a problem it falls on them it doesn't fall on the support staff right so they also have a higher level of responsibility so my point being is is that having people start together and end together the whole entire day it creates a camaraderie um that that everybody just feels like they're friends they are friends as a matter of fact they are friends you know, when, when people, best of, get, some of the best people I know in my entire life. Yeah. I mean, when, when people get married, they're all in each other's bridal parties. We're all part of the day. Um, you know, when we celebrate certain milestones in our lives, we're all there as guests. Um, it, it, it we've become a true family. We have, um, even Steven for argument's sake, um, Steven hasn't worked with us now in probably three to four three, years yeah, since COVID. Right. It's three to four years and he's gone on to build his own life with his wife and his two children. Um, but yet here we are today together and we still do chat. We still do. We still keep in touch. Keep in touch. Still you know, it, it's been a, it, it's, it's a lifelong friendship and relationship that we harbor uh, in the way that I've decided to do business. Um, I've even had Tuesday nights at the warehouse, which is a, ra a random Tuesday night where we'll play basketball, we'll order pizza and we'll yeah. hang out and just, just enjoy each other's company. And I think that's so key. And I, because I think there's a stigmatization that comes with service businesses, a plumber, a DJ, a photographer, they miss out on a lot of that bonding because the, the typical owner of those companies is very blue collar, just get the work done. Let's go home guys. That's it. 
but you took that mentality of, of like bringing some kind of culture to the company and really, really made it a presence felt because I don't look, I, and I've worked at a lot of places to date. I still haven't had that experience of having a true brotherhood together with, with a group of guys, women, whoever it happens to be and having it where we really looked out for each other, where if someone maybe made a mistake or an error on the job, there was always someone to kind of help out and assist and more importantly, be a mentor to show them how to do it, to train some, your staff now of how you really right. go about it. So we do, we, so that goes hand in hand with a lot of the cross training. We've done a lot of cross training over the years so that, you know, a DJ can MC if an MC needed to deal with something with their maitre d' or an MC can DJ if the DJ needed to run to the restroom or something like we've done a lot of that cross training or the lighting or any, really any, almost any. Yeah. Or if, if God forbid somebody got sick yep. and we needed to fill in, we always had backups. It actually happened just this weekend where one of my guys unfortunately couldn't work. There was a situation that arose and another one of my guys just were able to step in and, and do the job and everything was great. And we tell people that in the beginning that we do our very best to try to guarantee the person that you booked for the day and 98% of the time, the person that you booked for the day is going to be there. But in a rare situation, something may come up and you just have to know that you're hiring a company that everybody knows what they're doing across the board. And even if it's the unfortunate circumstance that someone can't be there, somebody will be there and we will handle the party to the best of our ability. And and to your point, you know, the the leadership team, it takes a lot of pressure off of the owner because you know you have guys that you've built up internally that can then train the up and coming DJs or roadies or lighting technicians to fulfill that higher level of status where there's an actual caring that's involved in there. And that's extremely rare. I would love to know, like, as you kind of gone through this journey and built up this reputation, built up this company, I'm sure there's been challenges. And I think one of the biggest factors was probably COVID because huh. no more events, no more money. You know, it's like it overnight literally decimated the entire event the industry. Now it's just the DJ world. I mean, I have a lot to say about COVID. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't even have to get political, but it's like, I know. No, 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 no politics involved. I will say that regardless uh, on what side of the fence anybody leans on, um, the government did definitely help out. Sure. Um, you know, and that's not a political statement. That's just the truth. The, yep. I was in need of assistance and they assisted and it got us through. Um, but COVID was um, a very unique situation for the live events industry because we were ramping up from our busiest year ever. Um you know, as a small business in 2019, we uh, broke over $2 million in revenue. That's something to be very proud of, by the way. Which was that's, amazing. That's amazing. It was like actually almost $2.2 million. As a guy from Brooklyn who just started DJing block parties, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah, it was over $2 million it. in revenue in 2019. And 2020 was ramping up to be the best year ever in that we were probably on the run to do like another 20 to 25% more than that. Um, we were so wildly popular at the time and um, really in a good groove. And then March came and it was uh, March 11th or 12th. We were at an event and we were hearing um, news that they were gonna shut it down you know, that was the, the to, not to interrupt you, but that was the last time I DJed was, I think I want to say it was March 10th. It was me and Steve Caruso at Bryant Park Grill about a few days prior to the, the shutdown. Yeah. And then we wound up doing a couple of more events after that. And um, then it was done. It was over. It was done, completed, gone empty. Uh, and we just really were listening to the news. Oh, it's going to be two weeks. It's going to be three yep. weeks. It's going to be a little blip. Um, and then it was... Uh, well, maybe by Easter, and then it was maybe by July 4th. And, you know, we just kept uh, wondering what was happening. And I kept hearing on the news about the restaurants, about mm -hmm. they have to be rescued. The government has to help the restaurants. And I kept feeling like, what about the gig workers? What about the people in sure. entertainment? All service-based industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, where do we stand in that? If we should, you know, the, they're talking about catering halls and restaurants. 
but it didn't trickle down to the people who were also suffering or the people who worked those events. Uh, the florists, the the limo drivers, the the photographers, the videographers, the DJs. Talking about the, the multiple tens of billions of dollars in industry. So yeah, absolutely. So um, I wound up um, gonna. I'm gonna take a little um, diversion here, but I wound up getting involved with a bunch of people in the industry, and we created a little coalition uh, to try to get the local governments to hear us, and then we. In the process of doing that, we learned that there was already a coalition that was being formed in the Midwest called the Live Events Coalition, um, and that they were, these coalitions were popping up randomly in other states. So we joined forces with this Live Events Coalition and then joined forces with all these other little state-run uh, groups of people and created a nationwide live events coalition that still lives and breathes today. Oh, okay. Um, it does. And we've been uh, working with lobbyists and we were able to um, get the government to hear us. Um, it, it took a really, really long time to get anything out of it um, officially, but at the very least, we are now believed in the eyes of the government to be a viable job um like people just thought oh you're a dj still to this day in 2020 I'm sure. like you move like they don't think of as a business you're a cop moonlighting on the weekend as a dj but they don't realize that this is people's livelihoods um but yeah so covid was a uh, was an interesting uh juxtapose for us because we went from working every single weekend every single night of the week almost to not working at all and then wondering where our next paycheck was going to come from um, fortunately, the government put out the PPP loans, which in our case were, thank God, both forgiven. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to... Um, it was a lifeline you needed to kind of just keep... We were able to sustain. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in addition to that, um, we took the EIDL loan, and so now I'm paying that back slowly, uh, but it was 3% over 30 years, so it, it's not a big hit every right. month. Um, but the truth is, is that COVID really changed a lot. So yeah, let's go into a little bit of how it changed even the sales process, because it used to be that a client would come into the office, sit down with that, with, uh, you know, whoever the salesperson was and book their event. And now we're seeing a huge transition into re remote work and zoom calls, which I believe has changed that dynamic tremendously when it comes to building rapport. So speak about a little bit of what, what you've seen in, in the DJ industry. So it's it's been a huge challenge because Zoom has become the norm. Um, the problem with that, in my opinion, maybe I'm old school, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just the truth, is that when you come to the office and you see uh, people and you, things are bustling and the phone's ringing and people are having meetings and... We have a beautiful experiential uh, office right behind us where music is playing, there's lighting um, is going on for the to simulate what an event looks like. Um, we're offering cappuccino or coffee. Sure. Uh, there's, or, a, there's a customer service element. There's an element here that creates a credibility and it also creates um, a high-end feeling. If you go to Zoom and everybody's in their pajamas and they're you know, sitting on their couch and their cat is crawling all over the back of them or they're, you know, eating takeout while you're trying to have a meeting with them or their phone is ringing and they're being disturbed. It, it It's a different dichotomy. It's not the same experience. And what it, what it did was it went from being about the experience to being about the money. Mm. Um, people were completely willing to spend more money based upon the experience that they knew they were gonna get from Eclipse events. Whereas now, through a Zoom, you have to try to differentiate yourself in a far different manner because they can Zoom with anyone and they can have a nice backdrop, a virtual backdrop, and it all looks the same. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenge as a business owner now is to come up with creative ways to capture as much of that in-person element as you can and bring that online to the best to your ability, so to speak. Yeah, but you also, as a as a salesperson, you know, you, you don't want to think this, but you do get fatigued. 
because you're doing Zoom after Zoom after Zoom and it becomes monotonous and repetitive mm -hmm. and it, it it's very, very difficult and increasingly more difficult to keep it fresh. Sure. Um, so we do try to make sure that we do in-person meetings. Unfortunately, we're not that successful at it. Um, I would say maybe about 80% of the meetings are still through Zoom, even though COVID is behind us. Um, and it, it's, What'd you say? Uh, kind of here to stay, with that, from what you can say, as far as this remote work, d d digitalization now of... Uh... I believe it's definitely here to stay. Um, again, I say it's unfortunate in the highest degree because the client is actually doing themselves a disservice because they're not able to get the full experience. It's almost like if you're booking a venue, you have to go see the venue. You have to get the vibe and the feeling for the venue. If you're going to book a tasting, they're not going to deliver the taste, the food to your home. You're going to go to the venue for a tasting. So it's on the same level. You, this is your entertainment for your special day. So to, to book it over the phone or through a virtual meeting is so difficult. And at the end of the day, if they meet with three people in a night and one person is a little bit cheaper, but they got a similar vibe, they're going to go with the cheaper person. So now it's become a little bit of a race to the bottom with pricing. We do try to hold true to our pricing because we are worth it and we do believe that we're worth it. Um, but sometimes it that's an uphill battle for us. For sure. I know. To, that. Prove, to prove that. Yeah. And, and I think it's going to be a continuous challenge not just to the event industry but really almost anyone who is doing sales in person now let's take a step back and do it over zoom there's going to be some extreme adaptability that's going to have to occur because you're to your point i don't see this kind of going away and i think the next generation even behind me in their early 20s won't even know the experience of working in an office environment which is crazy to me um and then you're going to have these this gen z now we're going to be getting married who they can't conceive of actually sitting across the table from someone to book a book a, a wedding package or to learn more about your services and get that true feeling and experience because they don't know any better. They don't know any better. And the, right. the funny part is, is that we've often toyed with not keeping the office. Um, but I still very, feel very strongly about the office, not only from the customer experience, but also from the human interaction that we need as a company to uh to sort of brainstorm and sure. come up with ideas and be creative um you know being here in the office has really been instrumental in our growth uh against the zooms for the for the clients because now we're trying to figure out new ways of marketing to the to this generation that is all um zoomed out if you will for sure and i can attest personally from working here that the best ideas came when we were all locked into a room in person discussing the challenges that were coming up this this weekend whether it was staffing issues whether it was making sure that the operations were streamlined coming up with the best marketing strategy to provide as much value as possible to the end user client and i feel that you only really, really can do that when you're sitting across the room from each other as employees and as team members and feeding off each other's energy and it's oh, just really hard to agree, calculate that a lot. Agreed, one hundred and fifty percent. And don't get me wrong; this benefits to being able to work remotely on Mondays and Fridays, have the flexibility. But I think we, as a society, will suffer on the value of whatever service you're you're potentially getting. Um, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't. Be, I felt it was a disservice to myself to stay home during COVID, even though there was no work. I stayed home for about three weeks, and you must. And I was, I was going crazy <laughs> because. I felt like I was not going to be as productive without being in the office. And all I did when I was in the office for that whole time during COVID, I was here alone. Um, all I did was reach out to event planners, reach out to venues, just keep in touch with people. I wasn't booking any work. Sure. I just was staying relevant mm -hmm. in the minds of people so that when this thing was over, that we would stay relevant. Um, Absolutely. And I, I really feel that that a kept my sanity by being able to leave the house and going into the office. Um, it also gave me an opportunity to restructure a lot of things, cut a lot of the fat on some bills we were paying that did, we didn't really need to pay anymore. Mm -hmm. um, sort of become a little bit more streamlined. 
you know, reorganize all my files and kind of keep things in a, you know, in a mode where it was a lot more efficient for and, the future. And strategize and plan. And with that, we can segue a little bit to your future plans of where you see the company, where you see yourself in the next couple of years. Are you looking to expand further into the event industry of like maybe opening up an own, your own venue? Are you looking to really just hone in on your process right now and just perfect what's going on? Like what's, what's the, the, uh, the short-term and long-term strategy? So I think the short-term and the long-term is somewhat similar. Um, I don't want to get into a venue type of situation. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to really keep evolving and figuring out how to market to this new generation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we started an educational series on our Instagram that we post every week and people seem to be liking it because it's not a sales pitch. It's just right. an educational series. How much value can you give without absolutely return? Right? Um, I think that the, the company that we have now has all of the bones to be super, super successful. We're not even close to our capacity of what we could do um, with the existing staff that we have. Mm -hmm. So I feel that honing in on that and know, and doing what you know and know best is going to be our recipe for success going forward. Um, I do not feel as if I want to change my course of action other than I want to build on how to market and how to how to grasp and how to give the same experience to the people who are not willing to come in person. Excellent. And I ask this to every podcast guest, if you had to rewind the clock and speak to a younger Michael Spinato who's 25, 30 years old, who maybe just took that leap of faith and quit his job to make things to make things work, what advice would you give to that person and and really to the general person who wants to become an entrepreneur? Not necessarily in the DJ business, but just in, in best practices. Someone wants to get into the service industry. So, uh, you know, I um, I will tell you, if I was to give advice to my 25-year-old self, that advice would be to um, choose three things. There are three things that you need to know when choosing a career. Um, number one is that you have to love what you do. Um, if you... If you go to work every day and you're miserable, then it's all for nothing. It's all for naught, and you should not be doing that. Um, it's so hard for people to take that into consideration. But you have life. to love what you do yeah. because you literally spend the majority of your life at work. Um, and if you don't love it, you just there's no point in it. So that's the number one. Number two is that you need to be able to make a good amount of money. Now, when I say a good amount of money... I honestly believe that money does not, I said this to you before the interview, yep. money does not make you happy. Money will just help you in being worry-free. You have to make your own happiness in life. So being happy at your job is number one, um, but make enough money where you could go on a vacation or two every year. You could, you could have um, some things that you enjoy. If you're a car enthusiast, you can drive a decent car. It could even be just paying your bills. It could just be paying <laughs> your bills. You're not worried every where, time. Right, where you man. don't have to right. worry about making sure that you can make that money to to live. If you are if you need, for random numbers, if you need $100,000 a year, then shoot for 150 or shoot for 200,000 a year. You don't need to make in the millions. Um, so, Love what you do, make enough money to live a worry-free life. And number three, which is something that I missed the boat on early on in life, and I'm really making that up now, is try to choose a career that is conducive to a good family life. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I dove into my job. I dove into my company, and I worked, 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 worked. Um, and I did miss a lot of things when my kids were growing up, and my wife was alone a lot. Um, and if I could do it all over again, I would make sure that number three of making sure that it was a good family life would have been more prevalent. Yeah, absolutely, man. And with that, that's incredible sage advice. Um, I think we'll end it on that beautiful note. Mike, Steve, love you as well. I love thank, you as well. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And until next time, thank we'll you. Have you on again soon. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed. Take and I care. hope you have some inspiration from this. <laughs>